it says the form. So if x, I'll call it star, just to denote it by this specific form, is in asymptotically stable equilibrium form of the dynamical system. Then the strategy, which I will just call x star x star, is a Nash equilibrium. In other words, if you can prove from the equilibrium points you find for the dynamical system that one of them is asymptotically stable, then that point is a Nash equilibrium. So with our prisoner's dilemma from before, I didn't prove it to you, but it was pretty straightforward because the Jacobian was always less than zero. That strategy to defect is asymptotically stable. So it's a Nash equilibrium of the prisoner. Um, the question is though, I only describe what it means to be asymptotically stable in one context when I talk about the ontological <laughs> But there's another shortcut you can use as well, and I'll explain that. So there's, what I wrote down before was also called the Antonov's theorem or the Antonov's method. There's another the Antonov's theorem too, and that goes as well. So I'll call this the other the Antonov's theorem. But it's really simple to imply this. It simply says, if all eigenvalues of or associated to an equilibrium point have negative real part. then this point is asymptotic stable. Asymptotic stable. So it's a convenient way. But as you'll see, it's not always applicable in this example. So, in summary, if some equilibrium point is asymptotically stable, it's a Nash equilibrium. That's how you find Nash equilibriums for these systems. And a quick way, if you don't want to use the Lyotunov's theorem, the one I did about finding the functions and so forth, um, this is another theorem you can use to determine which of your equilibrium points are asymptotically stable. E, so that's a Q, not, it's supposed to be a Q. Somehow it got written as EA. So let's see an example. So, example. But this example, my hope is, will generalize to every example we do now. It was kind of cheap, the first example I did, because you still got just one equation at the end of the day. Now this will show you how all this stuff will be written. So example, a rock, paper, scissors. I wonder what somebody would think if they walked in right now. So, with all of these things, the first thing we do is we set up our payoff matrix. So, two strategies. So, rock, scissors, paper on the square one side, and rock, scissors, paper on the other. And then we fill in these entries according to the payoff to the player one. That's by convention. So, if rock plays rock, there's zero payoff to this idea. Rock plays scissors, it's one. Rock plays paper, minus one. And you just fill in. So, scissors plays rock, it's minus one. Scissors plays scissors, it's zero. Scissors plays paper, it's plus one. And then one, minus one. 
So as expected, you have a diagonal of zero entries for this type. And now we just use the same equations as before to write down our diagonal. Given this pair. So remember, I said you just read it out. It's that simple. So let's see what. And obviously, on an exam or something, I would not expect you to memorize these equations. This is not the purpose of this course, economics. I will give you the equations I want you to know. But I will not do the analysis for you. That you must do yourself. There are many of you that will not I will. I will. <laughs> okay. So, let, as we did before, x1 denote the proportion of play that play the rock strategy. x2 will be the, uh, what do I want, what is it? Yeah, that's how I wrote it here. And then x3 denote the proportion of players that play. So x1, x2, x3. And we have equations now that tell us how we do that. In particular, we have the following. So x1 prime, if you remember, is equal to the payoff of using the raw strategy minus the average pair times x1. And similarly for the other cases, so this is pi s of x minus pi average x2, and x3 is the same. And of course, we have the constraint where x1 plus x2 plus x3 must be equal to one. So the question is now, uh, what are the individual pair functions? And what's the average one? So as I said, you just read that off directly from the table. Yes. There are constraints where you can say, which is common to do in physics, for example, where you just want the sum of zeros to be greater than zero, let's say. So then you replace the constraint with the inequality. Okay, so there's no way to determine No, no. Okay. Okay. In, this, in this context, it makes sense from a physical point of view, right. because we want each group of the population to be at 200%. Yeah. So it makes sense here. But in general, no, that is not. So let's fill in these functions, just like I did with the prisoner's dilemma. <coughs> so, pi of r of x, you just read off the first one. So it's 0x1 plus x2 minus x2. X2 minus X3. Similarly, for the other ones, you have pi of S of X is equal to minus X1 plus X3, and pi of paper of it is equal to X1 minus X2. Just from reading this. And then you can compute the average pair of function. which is simply given, if you remember the formula, there's three strategies here. So it's xi times pi of si minus x. So in this case, it's equal to x1 times the first strategy, x2 minus x3, plus x2 times x3 minus x1, plus x3, x1 minus x3. So far, so good. 
If you've not read the notes from the last part, maybe you're completely lost as to what I'm doing. But hopefully, that is not the case for the majority of you. Uh, so, yes? What's that distinction when you're, when you're saying I and S, I and R? Yes. Yeah. Denoting the strategy. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, sorry, it's not just the same thing. Um, it's the yes, other strategy. I just rewrote the same way I did it last time. Okay. So now let's fill in these things here. Okay. So we have expressions for each one. Let's put them into our dynamics. Okay. So in particular, I'll work out one for you, and then you can do the other one. So x1. So let me show it now pi of rx and the other trio. So that's x2 minus x3 minus x1 x3 plus x2 x3 minus x1 plus x3 x1 minus x3. And then we can expand out these brackets. So this becomes x2 minus x3 minus x1 x2 minus x3 minus x2 x3 minus x1 minus x3 x1 minus x3. I did not use mathematical I'm proud of these. And you continue on and you see a bunch of these are going to happen. That's it. In particular, x2 minus x3 minus x1 x2 plus x1 x3 minus x2 x3 plus x1 x2 minus x3 x1 plus x3 x3. And you see I have a bunch of cancellations. In particular, here and here, here and here. And here and here. See, so just like this. Fun, huh? Okay. So you get just x1 prime is equal to x1 times x2 minus x3. I hope. I'm pretty sure. And similarly, if you do it for the other equation, you get similar simplified results. You get in summary x1 prime is equal to x1 times x2 minus x3. You get x2 prime if you work out the x2 prime equation. You get that this is equal to x2 times x3 minus x1. And you get that x3 prime is equal to x3 times x1 minus x2. And the constraint is still x1 plus x2 plus x3. So subject to x1 plus x2 plus x3. Any questions so far? So it's straightforward, just algebra stuff, right? So let me ask you now, I have how many actual equations here? Two, Two equations. So let me therefore use the constraint to eliminate one of these. So I will choose to eliminate x3 because I'm lazy to carry the other ones over. So x3 therefore is equal to 1 minus x1 minus x3. So let me now substitute that into the first two equations. So much just to get what the actual equations are. That's fine. So by using the constraint, I will eliminate x3 from the first two equations. So you get that x1 prime is equal to x1, x2 minus 1 plus x1 plus x2. But of course, this is just equal to x1, 2x2 plus x1. 
And similarly for the X2 prime equation, you get that this is equal to X2, 1 minus 2X1. So you have two equations, two unknowns, and you have a 2 by 2 nonlinear dynamic. So in summary, X1 prime is equal to X1, 2X2 plus X1 minus 1. X2 prime is equal to X2, 1 minus X1 prime. Okay, good, that's it. All right, so it's nonlinear, I have no idea how to solve this. What is the first thing I do now? My first step. Very good. So that is when the right-hand side of the system is equal to 2. In other words, we see x1, x2, such that the right-hand side is equal to 2. But 0 simultaneously, so it's a system. So in other words, when x1 times 2x2 plus x1 minus 1 is equal to 0, and when x2 times 1 minus 2x1 minus x2. So, what are the possible solutions to this? There's one you can read off immediately. Zero, zero, zero. That's one. So there's one equilibrium point. When x1, x2 is equal to zero, zero. Okay? What about the other one? So, if we took care of this one, this is, turns out to be a linear system of equations. You can solve it. I made it nice for you. So it factors out. Okay. So the second one you get by solving this linear system. 2x2 plus x1 minus 1 is equal to 0. And 1 minus 2x1 minus x2. OK. Well, you can do matrices or simple substitution, whatever you want to do. In this case, it's simple just to do a substitution. So, in other words, from the first equation, I can write that x1 is equal to minus 2x2 plus 1. And then I can just substitute that into the second equation. Like simple algebra. So, substituting this out right away. So if substituting into the second equation, we get that 1 minus 2, minus 2x2 two two plus 1, minus x2 is equal to 1. But this implies, if you just simplify terms, that minus 1 plus 3x2 is equal to 0. And of course, that means that x2 is equal to 1. And if x2 is equal to 1 third, we know what x1 is because we have an equation for that. So this means that x1 is equal to 1. Interesting. So we have two equilibrium points. We have 0, 0, and we have 1 third, 1 third. This is the first time you've seen this in this course. We've had two equilibrium points. Okay. So one equilibrium point, x1, x2. 0, 0, and another one, x1, x2, is equal to 1 third. Is the points with x3 also equal to 1? Yes. So remember, they are still bound by the constraint. So x3 would be equal to 1 minus x1, x2. So it would be 1 third of the So you end up with 1, 2, 3, 1? Yes. Yes. But it's simple, it's simple to work in the two-dimensional case. It's algebra. Questions? So overall, one zero, one zero, one zero. That's
So now I have my third information. So now what do I do with that? What's the second step? So everybody's clear how I found the third information. Yes? Split it. So what does that mean? Do you have to So how do I find it? So now I need my Jacobian. So step one is to find the equilibrium point. Step two is to determine the stability properties of each equilibrium point. But that depends on the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. So I need the Jacobian. So step two is the stability analysis. But that just means, in other words, eigenvalues of the chain. The Jacobian. All right. So what is the Jacobian matrix, if you remember? How many functions do I have on the right side of my dynamical system in this case? How many, what's the dimension of my system? Two. Two. Right. So remember, in general, this is a dynamical system, and we have x1 is equal to f1, x2 prime is equal to f2, and so forth, all the way to x1. So we base our Jacobian on the right-hand side of this. So in other words, the first row, first column is df1 partial x1, partial f1, partial x2, partial f2, partial x1, partial f2, partial x2. That's it. And let's evaluate it. So now you have a choice. You want to determine the eigenvalues of this. You can do it in general for any x1, x2, which is actually pretty hard in terms of the algebra, because you end up having to solve maybe a quadric or something like this. Or the more practical way, which is almost how it's always done, now you substitute each point and then compute the eigenvalues now. So that's easier. So for point one, where x1, x2 is equal to 0, 0. Because remember, we evaluate our derivative matrix in the neighborhood of a point. So it's okay to substitute the point, right? And then compute the eigenvalues. 
That's what the Hartman Grogan theorem says. Okay, so if you substitute x1, x2, 0, 0 on this Jacobian matrix, you get something very simple. x1, x2 becomes 0 here, so you just get minus 1. This is 0. This is 0. And this is 1. And so what are the eigenvalues? Lambda 1 is equal to minus 1. Lambda 2 is equal to minus 1. So the eigenvalues are fixed and sound. They're both real. So what is this equilibrium point that represents? 7. 7. Very good. So therefore, x1, x2 equal to 0, 0 is a 7. But we want to be more sophisticated now in how we speak. So it is a seven, but I want to also, to be complete, state the following. And you can impress your friends now with this terminology. So, how many positive eigenvalues are associated with this equilibrium point? How many negative eigenvalues? And how many zero eigenvalues? So what is the dimension of the stable manifold at this equilibrium point? Of the stable manifold? One. one. And what is the dimension of the unstable manifold? And what is the dimension of the center manifold? Good. So to complete this analysis for this point, what we should say is therefore, at 0, 0, there is a one-dimensional Stable manifold and a one dimensional unstable manifold. And if you were really proper, you'd also compute the eigenvectors, which in this case is not that big of a deal because it's just one zero and zero one. So, where, so that I use the notation WS and WU from my own. So this is WS and this is WU. And in particular, WS is tangent to the stable subspace, which I call ES, which is just the span of the eigenvector associated to minus 1, which is just equal to 1, 0. And WU is tangent to EU, which in this case is just 0. You don't have to do this every time. It's a pain to compute eigenvectors for other systems, but just for completeness. But you should, at minimum, state the first line. Yes? Would this be an example of a more complex? Yes, it would be. Yes, it would be. But it's just words. But the, the, so, but as you can see, as I told you before, the whole stability depends on the other. Once you know this, then you know everything. Any questions about this? Okay, now let's do the one third, one third. Okay. Any questions about this? So it's clear now? I, I told you it would be better, right? Everybody's getting all scared. What are these manifolds and stuff? It's be patient, trust me. Okay. What? Is the the right? Uh, subspace. Yes. So now we come to the formidable point. And you'll see why I'm saying this. And hopefully now the analysis of this will help you on your assignment. So now, we have to analyze, analyze the stability of the second group. At x1, x2, is equal to 1 third. As usual, we will substitute it into the Jacobian and complete the other. So, the Jacobian at this point simply becomes 2 1 third plus 2 1 third. 
minus 1, 2 times 1 third, minus 2 times 1 third, and then 1 minus 2 times 1 third, minus 2. Okay, I don't know that that simplifies to, but I'm pretty sure it simplifies. So if you work out these little fractional computations, the first entry is one third, two third, minus two third, and minus one third. Mm -hmm. What are the eigenvalues? So I'll erase this now, I don't need to anymore. Any ideas or quickly what are the eigenvalues of this matrix? Fast, fast. It is. So what are the eigenvalues? How does it help me find? I don't them? know. I just thought it'd be a good idea. No. Are you guessing? <laughs> okay. If you compute the eigenvalues, you get it. Yes. So I will save you the suspense. I hope you can do this on an exam. No. You're missing one letter in your number. Okay, anyway, I will save you this experiment. Lambda 1 is i over root 3. Lambda 2 is minus i. Oh no! Whatever do we do now? I have no idea what to do. No, I do, but. about sinks or sources or saddles because the eigenvalues are zero for zero. So I will mention this because it's relevant for your bonus question. In a case of a two-dimensional system, when you have a conjugate pair of imaginary eigenvalues like this, this specific unit has a, has a name. And we call it, in this case, one third, one third is a center. So it's the missing case when you have the zero eigenvalues. Only in the case of two dimensions, when your eigenvalues are conjugate pairs of each other like this, so plus or minus i over root 3, we call this a central equilibrium point, not a sink source of size. And why is it called this? It's because what you get is a pair of concentric circles around your equation. Those are supposed to be circles. 